So since we've learned about what TSNI actually does, let's try to run TSNI on simple data sets to understand how, what, how TSNI behaves. So this is extremely important. And for this purpose, I'm using a terrific blog called distill.pub. Let me write it here. Uh, distill.pub is, is a terrific blog written by uh, written as a collaboration between a lot of companies and spearheaded by uh, Google uh, Google Brain or Google Research. So distill.pub is, is, is a brilliant blog where they take state-of-the-art techniques in machine learning and deep learning and AI and they try to simplify it. They, they try to simplify it, trying to give an intuition of how it works. And their first blog uh, in, I think, late 2016 was how to use TSNI uh, uh, effectively or how to, how to interpret the results of TSNI. And this blog was written, uh, and uh, by the way, distill.pub is currently being collaborative. It's, it's a collaborative work between some of the best companies out there like Google, uh, OpenAI, and a bunch of other state-of-the-art uh, state of the art companies which are working on cutting edge AI. Right? This, is a, this is a great work where they're trying to simplify, trying to give an intuitive understanding using using examples, using live examples in some cases. So this is, so I think reproducing the results is very, very hard from my end as, as, as a single course developer. So I'm building on top of, I'm sitting on the shoulders of, standing on the shoulders of giants like uh, like people at Google Brain who have, who have pu published this distill.pub. This, and we are just, I just wanted to, uh, credit the actual sources before I go and explain them. So let's see, let's see, let's see. So this page has this page has a very very interesting visualization. Okay, let let's go and understand. So before we even go and understand what this need does, let's let's run it. So imagine, imagine I have a simple data set. Imagine that I have a simple data set. What we will do in this case is, see what is dimensional reduction that I have a d-dimensional data. And I want to project into d dash dimensions. Now, to understand how an algorithm works, what if I make d equals to d dash equals to two? Okay, so I have original data. This this is only to understand. Remember, this is only to understand how how the how how the algorithms are working. This is only to understand. Okay, so what 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 distal dot pub has done is it has taken a bunch of interesting data sets. So let's go through them. So this is a data set where I have three groups of points. They're coloring them as blue, orange, and green, just so that I understand what's happening here. Okay, so, so my data set is basically three groups of points in 2D space. Let's say this was feature one and this is feature two. And now I'm trying to embed them into a new space where this is F1 dash and this is F2 dash. In, d in dimensional reduction, I understand that you go from D dimensions to D dash dimensions where Typically, d dash is less than d. But in this case, we will make d dash equals to d so that we understand how the algorithm is behaving internally. So if if what we have here is exactly what we get here as output, then the algorithm is working perfectly. Right? So here in this case, distill.pub has created brilliant data sets. For example, I can take this data set, for example. Okay. So as soon as I click on this data set, this is the original data set. And as TSNI algorithm runs, this is the output that I get eventually, right? So they're actually running the TSNI algorithm in, in, the, in the browser right here using JavaScript, okay? So imagine if my original data set was like this, two parallel lines of points, okay? So TSNI basically runs. So TSNI is an iterative algorithm. TSNI is an iterative algorithm, which means TSNI tries to process all the data in iterations and eventually it wants to reach a stage, eventually it wants, so it goes, it does the first iteration, second iteration, third iteration, so on, so forth, okay? And eventually it wants to reach a stage where the clusters are no more moving. At every stage, it tries to move the points. At every stage, it tries to find an embedding, okay? And with every stage, it will try and improve the embedding so that it's as good as possible. So that it's trying to preserve as many neighborhoods as possible, okay? So now let, let's take this example. So there are, so each of these data points, for example, if you take these two parallel lines, okay, there are 50 points per cluster. So there are 50 points here. There are 50 orange points and there are 50 blue points. Okay, between these two blue points, there are 50 blue points and there are 50 orange points here. Okay, so there are two most important parameters. There are two most important parameters of your TSNI. 
the first parameter is called perplexity the second parameter is called step size let me explain you what they are so step size step size is basically the number of iterations so just remember that with every iteration you are you're going to find a better solution right so the more the iterations because what as i told you this is an iterative algorithm where first it will iterate through all the points in iteration 1 iteration 2 iteration 3 and in this case we go up to iteration 5000 right and in every iteration it tries to find a better solution for example if i just run this right now let let me just run this okay uh, let me just run this so if i just rerun it okay see as the step size increases or the iteration increases my result is getting better and better let me just erase this right now so notice this as my step size as my step size so let me refresh it again my original data is two parallel lines of blue blue points and orange points now let, let me just see okay so okay so at iteration 14 you don't get the shape right if i continue by the time i go to iteration 100 right i'm getting some parallel line type structure right if i keep going on if i keep going on okay at, at, at around iteration 2100 i get this shape okay which is sort of like two parallel lines right which is sort of like two parallel lines here okay with some with some arcing here which is which is interesting we'll see why that happens okay but eventually if i continue if i continue from 2000 iterations if i keep going ahead okay okay so as just look at this as the as the step size or the iteration number increases the shape is stabilizing and now the shape doesn't change much we have reached about 3000 iteration and the shape doesn't change much let's see that once again just to understand this just notice as the step size increases this shape starts getting more and more stabler it will start moving less and less okay let's let's see that okay as it increases yes yes it's trying to now it's trying to move towards the best shape which is actually two parallel lines okay we have reached about 2000 iterations it's it's almost stopped moving now okay now it has converged at the end of 5000 iterations you almost get a structure like 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 this with some with some arcing this is very similar to the actual underlying structure of data right so similarly if you if you look at so that that's what step size means so step size or step here it's called step not step size sorry here step is nothing but number of iterations you are performing and remember that more the number of iterations the better is the solution okay and you should keep iterating till till the time the shape doesn't change much that's called till the time it reaches a stable configuration what is stable it means this shape this shape is no more moving we saw right a while ago that after 2000 iterations this shape hasn't been changing much okay that's so that's one parameter it's called the number of iterations or step in this block the second or the most important parameter of tsne is called perplexity let's understand what perplexity means you can think of perplexity roughly or loosely roughly or loosely as the number of neighbors the number of neighbors number of points or number of instead of using neighborhood as a distance measure so if i have this instead of saying that this is my neighborhood what if i say I want to preserve distance of five of my nearest neighbors. Okay, five points. So if I say, if I if I make my perplexity equals to five, what it tries to do is for every point, it will take five points. It will take five points which are closest to it. Okay, which are these five points, and it will try to preserve these distances instead of preserving a dist in a distance of d. Instead of doing that, it says so perplexity can be loosely thought of again there is a lot of mathematics behind it which i'm which i'm which i'm which i'm skipping for now but you should understand that perplexity can be thought of as number of points right loosely number of neighbors to which to whom the distances i want to preserve when i go from d dimensions to d dash dimensions okay so these are the most important things and we'll see what happens as we change uh, the number of iterations which is step and perplexity we'll see a lot of examples in this in this in this uh, in this blog this blog is terrific even though it might take a little more time than usual for us to cover this this is brilliant blog okay let's go let's go through examples now we'll, we'll come back to revisit these examples this is brilliant suppose if i have data set like this right as i keep eventually i'll get a data set okay you can see the structure here right you can see this uh, this not like structure evolving out of it so all of your violet points are here just like this all of your light green points are here 
right? All of your uh, darker green points are here or reddish green points are here, right? So by, by 5000 iteration, I get the structure of the data, right? Similarly, if I have my data set like this, two rings, right? Eventually, I've reached a two-dimensional embedding, which is two rings. And I've reached it even just by 1000 iterations, okay? So the two most important parameters, just to reiterate, are step size, or sorry, step or number of iterations, sorry. Step size has a different meaning in optimization. Sorry, it is step. So we, I typically call this iteration. That's why I'm getting confused between step and step size, sorry. So let's just call it number of iterations and perplexity, okay? Two most important. Perplexity says how many data points in the neighborhood uh, with whose distances I will try to preserve when I do a dimension introduction. Okay, let's go through examples now. This is, this is the most interesting part. So our first example is this. Okay, our first example is, uh, let me change the color here just in the, okay, I'll, I'm taking dark green here. Suppose if I have, because orange points are already there, I don't want to mess it up. So imagine originally I have my data set like this. I have a bunch of, uh, bunch of blue points and a bunch of orange points. Now in each case, my step is 5,000, which means I'm running it for 5,000 iterations, right? This is very, very important, okay? Now, the first thing that you'll notice is if I make my perplexity very low, if I keep my perplexity to, which means I am trying to preserve only distances of, distances to two nearest neighbors or two points which are, which are the closest to a given point, okay? If I make my perplexity 5, 30, 50 and 100 and remember, I have 50 blue points here and 50 orange points here, okay? That's how I've constructed this data. When perplexity is very small, See, and we want to we want to re, we want to uh, get this structure right, which you can see and perplexity equals to thirty and perplexity equals to uh, thirty and fifty. You're getting roughly this shape, roughly, not necessarily exactly, but roughly this shape, right? Now comes the interesting part. When perplexity is very small, you're getting a structure like this structure. If these are your blue points, and if these are your green orange points, this structure is completely absurd. So when perplexity is small, the results you get can be crazy, right? As perplexity increases, as perplexity increases, right, uh, your shape will start to get much, much so sensible. Again, this is not sensible. This seems more sensible, right? That you have two groups of points. So for example, if this is some high dimensional data, as soon as I visualize this, I say, yes, there are a bunch of points here, there are a bunch of points here, and they're well separated, okay? Now there is a catch here. So the lesson from this, the lesson from this is number one, always run your T-SNE with multiple, with multiple perplexity values, perplexity values, okay? Keep increasing the perplexity value. Never say perplexity equals to five seems okay. No, don't do that. Please don't do that. Run it for various values of perplexity and see the, see the shapes that are more stable. So as soon as you see this, okay, between 50 and 30, this table is fine. Now comes an interesting aspect. So first lesson is never fix one perplexity value. Always run your T-SNE for multiple perplexity values to understand the actual shape. So never run your T-SNE only once. That's the most important thing. So when, when you run T-SNE, you, you give two parameters. You give perplexity and number of iterations. Okay, never run your whole T-SNE. Your, your T-SNE function, right, in scikit-learn that we will see has these two, it, it has many other features, of course, but these two are the most important. Never run it with one perplexity value. Always try to run it with multiple perplexities. Now, here comes one more interesting thing. When I make my perplexity equals to 100, my total number of points are 100, right? When I make my perplexity equals to 100, I get a mess. This is literally a mess that I, that I end up in. Now, why is that happening? See, when, when, when I'm trying to preserve distances for every pair of points, see, when perplexity equals to 100, which means for every, and I have only 100 points here, right? What is my total number of points? Is only 100, 50 plus 50. So when you make your perplexity, the second most important lesson is, if your perplexity equals to number of data points, okay, you'll, you'll simply get a mess. So always try to keep your perplexity less than your number of data points. So the lesson learned from this is whenever you run your T-SNE algorithm on a data set, try multiple perplexity values 
till the time but never put perplexity equals to n or the number of points so you can think of this in another way perplexity so t sne as we learned does neighborhood embedding right but if i make my perplexity equals to n it's no more pre preserving just the neighborhood it's trying to preserve the whole data set the whole structure of the data set and where it does a it does a terrible job okay so this is this is one of the first lessons that we need to learn from uh, from tsne okay so please whenever you run tsne on a data set please run it with various values of perplexity and um, that, that's the first lesson the next important thing is sorry the next important thing is okay what if i keep my perplexity constant so if you look here so again same data set i kept my perplexity as 30 every time okay but i'm changing my step here which means i'm changing my number of iterations so my number of iterations or step okay i'm increasing stepping with only 10 iterations 20 iterations 60 iterations 120 iterations and 1000 iterations okay you'll notice that this this seems absurd right that, that, that i have all the points grouped in a small area here so the lesson is always run your iterations till the time the shape doesn't change much okay so when i start here by by 10 iterations i got some structure like this but don't stop here let it run till the time so probably at thousandth iteration you get a shape like this and in thousand one iteration these points don't move don't move much so always run your t sne so when you are analyzing t sne plot it plot your t sne for various values of step or iteration okay and see if this if the shape has stabilized okay so that's very very important so first lesson learned was always always run tsne for multiple values of perplexity find the right type of perplexity by keeping your number of iterations large and then change the iteration now to understand whether the shape is stabilizing or not this is a very important lesson okay there is one more small catch with tsne so tsne i explained you what is neighborhood embedding right okay neighborhood embedding we understood t distribution to solve the crowding problem why stochastic stochastic basically means probabilistic if i mean that's one way of thinking about it probabilistic so if you run tsne if you run tsne multiple times you might get small so if you run tsne multiple times on the same data set with the same perplexity value let's say same step or same number of iterations you could get you could get slightly different results slightly different results that's because tsne is not a deterministic algorithm what's a deterministic algorithm when the output if if if, if i have an algorithm if i give it some data every time i run this algorithm if i get the same value that's called a deterministic algorithm every time i run if i get a slightly different value that's called a probabilistic algorithm or a stochastic algorithm okay so tsne is actually internally the internals of tsne is actually a probabilistic algorithm so that's why tsne doesn't do just neighborhood embedding it does a probabilistic or a stochastic neighborhood embedding so that's the other lesson so if you have learned what is the right perplexity and the right number of so let's assume here you learned that perplexity 30 is good and number of iterations 1000 is good the next lesson is fix your perplexity and step run it multiple times because when you run it multiple times you might get slightly different results it's always good to see the results being run multiple times because every time you run there is a small difference in in what the output is okay so so th that's the next important lesson now comes now comes a scenario like this now imagine that i have 50 50 points i have 50 points here blue points that are and I have 50 orange points here. These orange points are very, very dense because I've packed all my points in a very, very small area, right? Right. So this cluster size is small or this group size because the variance is small here. Okay. These are sparse. These are sparse points, right? So now, now let's, let's see what happens as I change my perplexity and my, so I'm keeping my step size very large, 5,000 here, which is good. Okay. Let's assume I have determined that after 5,000, by the time I reach 5,000 steps, the shapes do not change much. Now, I'm increasing my perplexity here. I'm doing everything from 2, 5, 30, 50, etc., etc. Now, the one thing you realize quickly is 
as I'm going, okay, my 30 and 50 look good. But there is one big catch. Here, if you see the shapes of my clusters, the orange points and my blue points, both of them typically have the same density. This has the same density almost as this. But my original data set, my orange points are much more dense and my blue points are much more sparse. So one of one of the one of the things that TSNI does internally, one of the things that TSNI does internally is it basically expands, it basically expands dense clusters or dense group of points and it contracts or shrinks, it shrinks or contracts sparse clusters. Okay. So what TSNI is trying to do is TSNI, because, because, because of the way the mathematics inside TSNI work, what TSNI tries to do is it tries to, it, it because it's, it's also a stochastic neighborhood em embedding algorithm. One of the things that TSNI does is it shrinks. So these are sparse points, right? It shrinks these points and it expands these points because they're very, very dense such that the densities of the densities of both of my groups of points are roughly similar. So one of the one of the things that you cannot read from TSNI is whether a cluster is dense or sparse. You cannot get cluster sizes. Okay, this is called a small cluster because it's it's very very tightly grouped. This is called a large cluster. Right. So TSNI. So imagine this was the data. Imagine if we were never shown this. So imagine if you are shown only this. One conclusion that I could have come to is, oh, that, okay, my blue points are here, my orange points here, they're well separated, number one. Number two, oh, they're also, they also roughly have the same density. No, I can't come to the same density conclusion because TSNI tends to, tends to expand dense clusters and shrink sparse clusters. So I cannot say anything about cluster size. Okay, this, this is very, very important. Okay, having said that, so this is, this is one of the drawbacks of TSNI, by the way. Um, now let, let's go and see some other examples. This blog is terrific as I've told you. Oh, there, there is a, uh, we cannot also see relative sizes, right? So exa exactly this point, right? So let, let's go further. This, this is a very, very interesting example. Now. This example is, is mind boggling. Suppose if I have three groups of points, okay? Now in this case, what I'm doing here is, one second, sorry. Okay. Imagine if I have three groups of points, 50 points each. I have 50 points here, 50 points here, and 50 points here. Now you'll notice that between these two clusters, this distance, let's call it D1, is much lower than D2. D1 is much lower than D2, much smaller than D2. So if I have a structure like this, where I have two groups of points, or two clusters which are close, and the third cluster far away, right? One of the problems that happens is, See, I'm keeping my step size fairly high, right? Even for higher values of perplexity, even for higher values of perplexity, only at perplexity 50, this distance is much lower than this distance. But the, in this case, the distances are almost similar. Of course, when I go to 100, the whole, the whole thing goes crazy, okay? Because this has become much wider or much larger cluster. This has become much smaller cluster. But one problem is, imagine if I, if I was looking at perplexity 30, I could, I could conclude that all these three clusters are at equal distance from each other. While in the real world, in the high dimensional space, in the original data, they're not actually there. Your orange and blue points are much closer than your green points, right? So this is the example with 50 data points, right? Now let's take, let's take, let's increase the data set and see what happens. This is a better example. In this case, what they've done here is they have taken 200 points each. So you have 200 points of blue, 200 points of orange, and 200 points of green instead of 50 points, right? And of course, this distance D1 is much less than this distance D2, right? Now comes a problem. Whatever value of, so I've, I've kept my step size, I've kept my step, all right, number of iterations fairly large. Whether I take perplexity equals to 30, 50, or even 100, this shape, that D1 is less than D2 is not being preserved. In this case, all three of them are roughly at the same distance. Similar thing, right? So what, what TSNI is not doing is, TSNI does not preserve, TSNI does not preserve 
distances between distances between clusters okay we saw this example with 50 in the in the case of 50 right we at least got some good results when we had perplexed equals to 50 when we had 50 50 points each but when you have 200 200 points here whether you put perplexed equals to 50 or 100 see the state the, the shapes are stabilizing okay by just looking at these three i, I could say yes as I, as i'm increasing my perplexity this is all crazy this is still crazy but as i go from 30 to 100 yes the shape is stabilizing so i could conclude that okay i have three clusters here in my in my original data and all of these three clusters are roughly at the equal distance no you can't conclude that because if you have this as original data set this is what you could get as a, as, as the result of tsne so remember tsne does not preserve distances between clusters this this is a very very important uh, important observation or understanding this is how not to misread tsne see the name of the blog itself says misread tsne so never misread tsne and these are all very very interesting examples geometrically showing what happens in various cases of tsne okay so now let's go let's go down and see more examples or oh, this is this is actually very exciting so imagine if my actual data my original data is just random noise just random bunch of points okay random bunch of points now i'm keeping my iterations equals to 5000 and let's assume this data is actually in some high dimensional space okay i think in this case they've taken 100 dimensional space random points of course i can't visualize 100 dimension so they've taken some two dimensions and showing it to us that is actually random now here comes so when i have a small perplexity value there is one problem uh, when i have random data see one of the biggest problems in data science or machine learning is if you are making sense of random data if you're making sense of junk if you come to conclusions from junk you're you're literally it's an extremely dangerous position to be in never make conclusions from junk so random data is junk there is no structure to it right but when i keep my perplexity low i start getting these small nice clusters when my when, when my perplexity is low so i could conclude that oh there are this group of points here there are this group of points here and there are small groups of points here no please never do that always try your data for multiple values of perplexity so as the moment you increase your perplexity this nice grouping is gone right and what happens now and these are 500 points originally we have about 500 points here 500 random points so I, I, as your perplexity increases now the data becomes more and more more and more like random so by the time you reach perplexity of 30 or 50 things have become there is no structure here right it looks literally like a random bunch of points so never conclude that there is structure in data by just looking at one perplexity especially small perplexities always look at more perplexity values otherwise you might end up in a case where you're make you you actually have random data and you're trying to make sense out of it and you might even come to wrong conclusions which is extremely dangerous okay having said that let's move on let's move on to um okay so this is this is another very interesting example where i have data like this i have like i have like an elliptical data okay and when i have small perplexity you can start seeing shapes where there are none okay when i have small perplexity i'm getting these groups of points so again the lesson to be careful here is never just learn with a small perplexity keep increasing it by the time you reach a perplexity of 30 or 50 the shape is becoming more and more clearer but of course there are more points here in the center right here all the points are almost equally spread because we know the tsne the original data there are more points in the center here right but here uh, the density of points is almost spread because we know tsne tries to do this right we know internally that tsne tries to spread our points evenly right so that that's that's another thing so never never just look at small perplexity values or two or five even in this case you could conclude that okay there are these nice clusters here so never get confused by that the next thing very important is imagine imagine if i have a data set like this this, this is very very interesting again so this is my original data set two lines of parallel uh, two so i have my blue points like a line and i have my orange points like parallel lines these are called parallel line data store the, the basically data points which are parallel to each other now when i have my small perplexity anyway everything goes crazy but even as i increase my perplexity here i'm keeping my iterations equals to 5000 i could end up in a situation like this i could end up in a situation like this so this looks like like your uh, gene uh, like your uh, 
gene shaped data right but it's actually not your gene so always rerun your your tsne multiple times or increase the perplexity so here what happens is as I, as i'm increasing my perplexity i got this almost good shape I almost got a good shape and then it went crazy as I increased my perplexity. And when I made my perplexity equals to 100, it almost converts to the right shape that I'm looking for. Right? So whenever you get results like this, it's always good to rerun. See, that's why never draw just one T-SNE plot and come to a conclusion. Change perplexity, change step size, and third most important, always rerun with, with the best perplexity and step that you got or the number of iterations that you got. Okay? Having said that, let's move on now. This is much more exciting. Uh, these are called topological shapes. So imagine, imagine that I have a bunch of blue points, okay, inside my orange points. Okay. Suppose if I have a bunch of blue points which are very, very dense inside my inside my orange points. When perplexity is small anyway, it makes no sense. But as I keep increasing my perplexity, I will start seeing the shape eventually where all my blue points are inside my orange points but as soon as I increase my perplexity further I'm losing so I'll not get exactly this shape but I'll get a sense that okay blue points are inside my orange points but I'll not get the perfect sense see this shape is not exactly same as this shape or this shape right so it can perplexity of 30 here or perplexity of 50 can show the basic topology or geometry here okay topology is the study of shapes in mathematics it's a very very wide area Okay, so here the shape is called containment. Okay, because these points, these blue points are contained within, within my orange points, right? Here, by the time I have my perplexity 30, I'm getting a sense of what's happening. But all my blue points are inside my orange points. But as I increase my perplexity, I get a sense of what's happening without exactly replicating this result. TC never exactly replicates the result. Okay, so that's an important lesson there. Now, these are called, these are called interlocked rings. So these are more complex topological structures. Okay, this is a shape where I have two rings interlocking each other. Now, what happens here is when I have small perplexity, I just get disconnected. I just get disconnected circles. But as I increase my perplexity, eventually I'll reach a stage where my points show this interlocking structure of the data. Similarly, if I have, this is this is a very, very complex knot-like structure. So this knot-like structure is like, uh, like this. It's a very interesting knot-like structure and topology. When my perplexity is small, I get nothing. But eventually, as I increase my perplexity, I start getting this shape where all of my uh, uh, violet points here get grouped together. I get a sense of the geometry as I keep increasing or a sense get, get a sense of the shape or topology as, as I move towards this. So don't worry if you don't understand what topology means. Just remember that topology is a study of shapes. Am I preserving this shape? Yes, more or less. Okay. So this is, uh, again, by the way, this, this structure is called the trifoil knot. Trefoil knot, sorry. This is called the trefoil knot. It's a very, very interesting uh, shape in, in the study of shapes, uh, which is the area of topology. Okay, having said that, okay, now comes the interesting part. Okay, so if, if my actual data was my trefoil knot, right? If I, if I, if I, if I have 5,000 iterations every time, and remember, I'm running perplexity equals to two. These are basically multiple runs of TSNI. This is my original data. So with every run, I'm getting a different shape. What is the lesson from this? It means perplexity of two is the wrong thing because every time I run it, I'm getting a completely different result, which means th this perplexity two is no way the right stable answer, right? Now, instead, if I, if I run this, if I run the same thing with, let's say, this is my original data, I again run for 5,000 iterations or 5,000 steps. Instead of two like above, if I keep perplexity of 50, and if I run it five times, this is the outcome of five times, running it five different times. There is a slight difference. For example, in this, in this, between this and this, your uh, your uh, violet points are here. In this case, your violet points have gone down. But the shape is more or less well preserved, right? In this case, your violet points have come to the right. In this case, your violet points have come to the left, right? So by running the same TSNI algorithm multiple times with same value of perplexity and step or number of iterations, if the shape is stable, okay, shape could rotate. So this probably rotated like this and created this. Shapes can rotate, that's perfectly okay. Or if I rotate this slightly on this side, I get this shape. Or if I rotate this like this, I get this shape. That's perfectly okay. Okay, so by running by running my TSNI algorithm multiple times, 
if I can understand, if, if my shape is roughly the same, then I know that this perplexity value and this number of iterations is stable. So the most important lessons to learn for all of us, the most important lessons are always run your steps or number of iterations till the shapes stabilize. Okay, this is the first thing. Second is try various values of perplexity between if you have n points always try to keep it less than n but try to do it between 2 to n okay try to keep your perplexity try to keep your perplexity between 2 to n okay and see how the shapes are changing never run t sne once the most important lesson never run t sne just once and start reading it okay third rerun your algorithm rerun your t sne with a perplexity value and a step or the number of iterations multiple times. Just rerun it multiple times and, and notice whether the shape is stable or not. As we saw with the with the trefoil knot. Okay. These are the most important lessons of t -SNE. Never run your t -SNE just once. It's, it's a terrible, terrible idea. Okay. So, and thanks to folks behind distill.pub. It's a terrific blog which gave us all of this nice intuition. And as I promised you, let's just go up. You can play with this data for a very long time. So you have all this. So if I just go to the top of this page, I have all of these shapes. I have my trefoil knot here. And I can say I want the perplexity of let's say 50, 60, let's say. Okay, it's going crazy now. Okay, because uh, my perplexity is just too high. What if my perplexity is slightly low? Uh, okay, yes. As my perplexity is slightly low, by, by the time I reach 1000 iterations, I got the rough shape. Right? Epsilon, forget about it. Epsilon here is another parameter. Don't worry about it. It basically tells you how fast, how fast you should, you should change. How much should you change uh, from one iteration to other iteration? This is mostly an optimization parameter, which you can ignore. Just keep it at some reasonable value. Uh, I kept it at one, but you can just fix it at any value and just rerun it. The more this value is, the faster your data will converge. That's all. Okay. Which means the more epsilon, as epsilon increases, by the time you reach a smaller number of iterations, you will solve the problem. That's it. Not always guaranteed. There are some catches there. But just ignore epsilon right now. Just ignore epsilon. You can change your steps and your perplexity for various shapes, all the shapes that we studied. And as, as you change your perplexity and step, you can play around with this data to get a very, very good sense of how your how how TSNE behaves. This is one of the best visual, best uh, uh, best live examples that I've seen on the internet of, of explaining how TSNE works internally.